let the king arise and the enemies be scattered. Now let the heat your feet. As the smoke has driven away, so drive them away. As the wax melted before the fire, and so shall all we can't consider and melt in the presence of fire. Is why. In other words, why or what was it about Stefan's extemporaneous subcat, his 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 extemporaneous preaching here, that the listeners, right, the semi watch those who heard, what was it about what Deduce Estefano said that cut them to their very heart? Right? One could say, well, where should we begin in chapter 7 of Acts of the Past? Well, here's where we're going to begin. We're going to begin with verse 22. Right? 22. And here is verse 22, basically. Um, here's verse 22. This question that you have before you is based on and what you're seeing, those who are watching the video version of it, and it's based on Acts 7.22. And Estefanos, or Stephen, Stephen, he said, And Moses, Musa, Moshe, was learned in all the wisdom, all of the chokmah, right, of the Egyptians. Now, clarifying that because of the correct translation, the Book of the Seven Seals of the Conquering Line of the Tribe of Judah, we recognize that this should be more better translated as the wisdom of the Egypts, therefore implying the two Egypts, Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, or the Upper Egypt, more Inner Africa, Ethiopia, and the Lower Egypt, which is more towards the Mediterranean, which was like that Egypt was like America, you know, like everyone will come to America or many Africans want to come to Europe. So it was that sort of destination, destination Egypt for many different kinds of people. It was like the, the place where if you can make it there, you would make it anywhere. So there were two different kinds of Egypts, right? Now, we know that when Moses fled and he went into the wilderness or to Ethiopia, or the Ethiopian lands, the original lands, and the new lands, or the land of the ancestors, right? Where the ancient Yahweh's faith was preserved. Here's where the revelation came to Moses. We have the burning bush. We also have when he marries uh, Jethro's Horeb's um, um, daughter, Zipporah, Zipporah, who is known as an Ethiopian. All right, let's just make that very clear right there. But it was there when he fled, right, after he forsook being the son of Pharaoh's daughter to suffer with the people of Jah. Notice that, to suffer with the people of Jah. And where did this revelation happen to him? When he was among his cousins or the cousins of the Israelites, the Medeanites. And the Medeanites are also Hebrews by virtue of descent from Abraham and Abraham's third wife. And here's where we get the, the, the Shemitic or the Afro-Shemitic Sheba. Also, Sheba is one of those sons as well. So we get the, the Sheba, the, the Sabians also are Afro-Shemitic. Right? They are Afro-Shemitic based on the genealogical descent based on Genesis. So just get that background, that context. Go about the proper context, and many of us haven't received the context. When we get the, the proper context, then Santa Claus, Easter egg, and bunny can never satisfy a truly seeking heart of truth. It can never satisfy. You, you see, once you get the right context. But a lot of the folks who don't have it in the right context and have been um, 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 it's like giving a child candy for dinner. You know what I mean? I mean, they'll like eating the candy, but after a while, the cavities and the malnutrition and the bad health and the disease will become evident. In, in other words, either make the, the, the tree good and the fruit good or the tree bad and the fruit bad because a tree is known by its fruit. Right? The tree is known by its fruit and an apple seed, 
right? From an apple seed comes apples and an apple tree and apples, an orange seed, orange and, and oranges as well, or orange tree, right? So right here in verse 22, where it says, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts, the upper and lower Egypt, and was mighty in words and deed, or he was mighty in word and deed. Now, it's very interesting right here when we get to chapter 7 of Acts of the Apostles. This is the first time that we basically read this. It's kind of implied in Moses' second book, Shemot, or Rit Zesat, or the Hebrew book of Exodus. But it's not explicitly said. But now we have Stephen giving his testimony. He's testifying. Right? The general theme is the unbelief of Israel. That Israel did not want to accept the truth. It's like when we teach the truth of the King of Kings in Christ, many of our own people to whom this is the barakat, the blessing, they don't want to accept it. In the very same way, they didn't want to accept Caduce Estefano's testimony. But from verse 20, in Acts chapter 7 through verse 44, Stephen purposely gave a long narration. He gave a long divrei Torah, right? In the most positive way concerning Musa, concerning Moshe, concerning Moses. He did this to vindicate, to make righteous himself before his downpressors, his opposers, those who had opposed him who had accused Stephen of blaspheming Moses. Like many would basically say that, us saying that, well, Moses learned true Yahwism, right, from the wisdom school of the Egyptians as he got into the inner mysteries, the truth. It's like when Christ said to, almost the same thing is with the master, when Adonia Yeshua, comes forward, he accuses the religious authorities. He says, listen, y'all the religious guys, y'all have the keys to the kingdom, but y'all don't take these keys and enter therein, and y'all prevent anyone who wants to enter in. So right here, what Stephen is saying, basically it's pointing out to all the hearers, these are the real keys that your religious authorities Right or the religious archons or archons on earth prevent you from knowing. It's like when you study the Bible for yourself and you ask Jah to give you wisdom so you can see the truth of it for yourself. You'll find that it will have you 180 degree opposite of most of the so-called professing um, Christianity or have you opposite of what the, the religious pastors and preachers and authorities say. And it's not to say that they are not those pastors and preachers who are truly ministering the grace of God in Christ. But most of the pastors and preachers are still caught up on the Old Testament condemnation. They're not really preaching grace because see, if you're preaching grace, even radical grace, right? This is going to bring you into, into the stark reality of the martyrdom of Yeshua. You know what I'm saying? Where even friends and family, you understand? There's no friends and family plan in Yeshua. You understand? There's only a be born again and live. But he also tells us that, that because of his sake, because of Yeshua's sake, many of our own friends and family would hate us. And that's one of the prices that we pay gracefully Right for that salvation, but even for their salvation, because we continue to walk the way if we don't go astray. But most people turn back to men and people and figure that there must be a friends and family because this is the, the counterfeit form of it. Now, I say all this to say that in getting to what Moses learned, first point, Moses learned almost the same thing that we learned Two, when we come out of Babylon, when we come out of counterfeit Christianity, right? We learn that the word, the teaching is true, right? And Yeshua is real, but not the way they have tried to make us believe. 
that the religious system had made believe at this time in Egypt. That's why they did not know Yosef. That's why it says in Acts of the Apostles that there arose a king who did not know Yosef. What he recognized is that the so-called gods of the ancient Egyptians, right? The gods of the Egyptians were actually our deified or glorified ancestors. In other words, they were worshiping our ancestors. They made our ancestors into gods in front of the true God. But the true testimony of our ancestors is that our ancestors worshiped the true God and expected the true Messiah and therefore the, the great deeds of faith of Amen and Immet and the Amuna that were demonstrated through them was a testimony to the true faith. But instead of what they did, and this is the same thing you see in Christianity, look at the different kind of churches. They just don't start a church. If you're gonna start a church, why don't you just call it the, the Church of God? You know, why don't you call the church the church of God? There's this denomination, there's that denomination, and the next denomination. And you would think that Christ, that Yeshua, is divided into all these different denominations. If you didn't know any better. Because you have to remember that's the same thing with men and people today. Most people don't go directly to the scripture, right? They don't go directly to the scripture to learn, well, what thus saith the word. No, they go to men and people. They figure, well, I can't understand it. I need to go to men and people. And there's nothing necessarily, you see right here, he recognized that all of these were our ancestors. Our ancestors put into a cartoon form or idea. Now, the interesting thing is, when we start to go to the scripture, right, and start to really, like even Amen, right, the Amen, Christ says in in, 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 in Revelation that that he is the Amen, the beginning of the creation of God, right? The oldest and the most cryptic of the gods, right, as they call them, or of the Elohim, the family of Elohim is the Amen, right? The unknown, the hidden one. Now Yeshua reveals to us that he is that hidden one, right? It, that he is that hidden one, that Yeshua, right, is the Amen. You find that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Now, it's kind of very interesting to say, well, it's not really, he wasn't really the Amen, he was the Amun, and still they don't know how it's correctly pronounced. We know because we have gone to the root, the very same root, right, that Moses, right, that Musa went to as well. So Moses was learned right in all of the wisdom right or the the religious the the, the 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 keys he got to the keys right he got to the keys while other people were worshiping through the priestcraft right priestcraft right had deceived right the worshipers in the Egypt post Yosef Post Joseph. Joseph was like Josiah in a sense, if y'all know who Josiah is. Josiah was one who sought a a reformation, right? Like a reformation of, of old Israel. You understand? Like a, a, a kind of a renaissance in a sense to get back to the roots. But the damage, the deed was so deeply done, right? That consequences in the perfect law of the judge of sowing and reaping that they had sowed and had not repented Israel of that time of Josiah's time and the same thing with ancient Egypt Egypt was now blessed because Yosef one who was spiritually in tune with the truth even in the Egyptian um, religiosity or spiritual or wisdom system the true worshippers in ancient Egypt recognize that Yosef, he is the one. He's the one that now is showing us what our faith and what the true Yahweh's faith, and I'm saying that the ancient Egyptian faith was a Yahweh's faith. Originally it was a Yahweh's faith. Just like one time Christians were truly followers of Yeshua HaMoshiach, Yesus Christos, right? Live their lives according to Christ. But somewhere along the line, 
came in a compromise, like the compromise of Pharaoh. Somewhere along the line, Pharaoh wanted them to compromise. And that compromise is very, very interesting. In fact, I think it's either in this Torah portion, and I saw this in the footnote, right? In the footnote in Exodus. Let me see if I can find this right here. The compromise. There's a compromise proposed by Pharaoh, right? And in spiritual Egypt, there is this very same um, compromise that is proposed. What is this compromise? Well, the compromise that was proposed by Pharaoh in, I think it's Exodus chapter, in Exodus chapter uh, 8, let's see if I can find the verse right here. There was a compromise that Pharaoh proposed. Every spiritual Egypt, every every counterfeit preach, priestcraft system does the same thing. The contest with Pharaoh, the first promise was refused, and Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, the two witnesses, right? And said, go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. In other words, y'all go ahead, right? And y'all do your religious thing, right? You know, you know. You say you want to go sacrifice to your God, so go ahead, do your religious thing. And Moses said, it is not meat so to do. He said, basically, y'all can do your religion here. You don't have to go out into the wilderness and leave here. We're too dependent on you for our economy, for our devilish and counterfeit, you understand, way of life. You understand? We want y'all to just do your religion here. You understand? We'll give you religious rights. We'll give you or we'll promise you, right? We'll promise you religious freedom. How often have we heard that, right? We'll promise you religious freedom. And Moses said, it is not meat. It's not right. So to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. It's like I and I saying... It is not right for us to practice our way, right, in this spiritual Egypt. Because when we burn the, the cannabis, right, cannabis that some of our world of Memphis conduce, they then downpress us, arrest us, break up families, incarcerate men, women, and children, take away people's children, put them on psychotropic and pharmaceutical drugs, and all other sort of things. So Moses wisely, right, he saw that particular reality and he said that it is not meat to do so because the way we worship, if we say we see Yeshua, we see Jesus as being a black man in spirit, right, in truth. Well, in spirit, it's in spirit. In spirit, he is the light, but in his humanity, we see him to be our humanity as a Ethiopian, the Ethiopian Hebrew. Aren't you as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Tacitus, the Roman um, historian, said that the Jews of 70 AD were essentially of the race of the Ethiopians. From a Roman perspective, that is to say they were black. They were Negroes. They were niggers. Or to say, basically, because Negro, the Latin and all of that, right there. So Moses wisely said that um, for we sacrifice, what we sacrifice is an abomination of the Egyptians. What we sacrifice, right, is an abomination to the Babylonians in this spiritual Egypt. Is abomination, right? We shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to Yahweh Eloheinu. Lo, look, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes and will they not stone us? Now this is a very interesting connection seeing that we've been speaking about the martyrdom of Estefanos, right? The martyrdom of Saint Stephen. This is the connection right here, right? Notice what Moses says in Exodus chapter 8, verses 25 to 27. Now, there was a compromise that's proposed by Pharaoh. Are those that are urged, right, by the world, the flesh, and the devil, the spiritual Egyptian system of Babylon, right, upon Christians, 
right? And even upon I and I as Rastafari to this very day. The first says this, be a Rastafari. Okay, you can be a Christian, right? If you will. If you want to be a Christian, nothing wrong with that. You can be a Christian if you will. But don't be a narrow Christian. Don't be a Christian that walks truly on the straight and the narrow road. Don't, don't, don't be a narrow one. Don't be narrow-minded. Include some of our heathenism and our sheathenism. And stay in this spiritual Egypt. Right? Invariably, if you choose this, you make the wrong choice. Right? Because it ends in where failed Christianity is today. Right? We didn't say failed Christ because Yeshua has not failed and cannot fail. Right? But counterfeit Christianity has failed. They have failed to repent. They tell us, oh, they tell us, uh, um, it doesn't matter what color Yeshua is. It don't matter what color Jesus is. I mean, that's some fantasy sort of thinking. Christ took on flesh. Right? Therefore, he must have took on a particular kind of identity. The fact is that Caesar Bogiers is a blasted counterfeit antichrist lie, the whitewash. It has nothing to do with our racism to them, but it has to do with white supremacy's Faustian bargain. They made a deal with the devil. The devil told them that they are superior because of their skin color. The devil lied to them. Now their jig is up, but yet they still refuse to repent because of that world conformity. World conformity. World conformity, where does it lead to? It leads to world pleasing, right? We're pleasing the world. And it says, if anyone is a friend of the world, the flesh and the devil, then they are a hater. They are an enemy of Jah. Rastafari, they are the enemy of the true and living God and Father of our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos. And they are seeking, right, the world's ways, the world's economy, right, even the world's money. They're seeking the world's riches, which really the world's riches is vanity, but they're seeking that because they believe that it has value. That's why the master says that where one's treasure is, there will their heart be also, right? And there's reference scriptures to this as well. Psalm chapter 1, verses 9 to 17. You can compare that with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18, and Galatians 1 and 4. So what did Moses learn? What did Moses learn? He learned that the spiritual Egypt, the Egypt, the Egypt of his time, that the religious system was corrupted, but the truth was still in the word. In other words, the truth was in the word that in a sense, they were worshiping their own ancestors who were people of faith that the priestcraft has started to spin this whole yarn and have the people in a triple darkness, in, 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 in darkness to the Trinity, the true Trinity of, of God and Christ, to their spiritual soul and physical well-being. Thus, they were under the burdens, right? The burdens, heavily burdened souls, the burdens, and they was under the bondage, the religious bondage, right, of that Egypt that was ignorant, right, that did not know Yosef, that did not know the God of Yosef, the true and the living God. And this is the root, the crux of what Moses learned. It's just like someone who believed the whitewashed lie and the counterfeit and all of this, and then really sits down and studies the Bible and say, well, didn't these other people have the Bible? But they don't teach the Bible. What they teach is Easter egg and, and, and bunny rabbit and, and Santa Claus. And they teach all of this, you know, counterfeit image, counterfeit doctrine, things that Christ did not say that you do not find in the Bible. They approve of their own ancestors' vain 
in lying sayings more than they approve of the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, within the text, within the scriptures that were kept in the wisdom of the Egypts was the truth. And when Moses fled from lower Egypt to upper Egypt, in other words, when he went to Ethiopia and he got to the root, where the people were less cosmopolitan. They were still into country and country life. They did not get corrupted, right, by the world. You remember how Yeshua um, was was tempted or the temptation that that the devil made to Yeshua that if you bow down to me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. In a sense, Egypt of that time had fallen. Right, the height that it reached in Yosef and in Joseph, right, had fallen now, right, had fallen to an ignorance. In other words, they went away from the old time religion. And Moses, Mashu Muse, was restoring the old time religion. In other words, him and Aaron and and and, and Median, or speaking of um of, of Jethro, right? Because Jethro, remember, was a priest. He was a priest of Median, and Median was a province of the ancient, right, the ancient empire of the ancestors, or what ones would call the New or Tobia, right, or Upper Egypt. That's where the ancestors said along the Nile came the ancestors. If you study, you know, um, um, the Egyptology, you basically see that the Egyptians pointed right to upper Egypt and the direction of what we call Ethiopia or Kush, the new to be the root, where they still were Yahwist. They still believed right in the old time religion or the true interpretation that the gods, right, or those who were deified were nothing more than the faithful ancestors. But what happened was that just like it's happened with Christianity, right? Just like it's happened with Christianity where a lot of other stories were spun in. If you look at Christianity today, there's a lot of other beliefs, make-beliefs, that are more popular than what actually the Bible actually is, is ministering, what actually the Bible is testifying. They've put other gods, even some good people, so forth and so on, before the word of the Almighty. And many people who did not even affirm the word of the Almighty have been put before. I mean, this whole Santa Claus thing is just the most the most recent example because of the season that we are in. And they'll say, well, Santa Claus came from Saint Nick. Santa Claus has nothing to do with Saint Nick in truth. What they've done is recognize where they were caught and they were able to make a little dibby dibby connection. And most people are fooled by it because it says to them, stay in spiritual Egypt, right? Stay in world conformity. Stay in world pleasing. Stay doing things the world's way and think that you are going to do something for Jah. Keep thinking that you can bring the cursed world and the God of this world's things to Jah and that will be pleasing with the Almighty. So this is this is uh, part one. I want to kind of touch on other other aspects of this, but I wanted to give a kind of an overview, right? A, a basic, a general overview to, well, uh, what did Moses, right? What did Moses learn, right? What was it that Moses learned? Let's bring this up right here. What did Moses, if Moses, right, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, what did he learn? He learned that Yahweh, Right, that the Father and the Son, right, is one. He learned that Yahweh or the Yahweh's interpretation, and we'll go further into Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yireh, Re, and how Hagar, the Egyptian, when she met the angel of Yahweh, she said, Berlahai Roy, and he, she called the, 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 the God of Abraham, the true and living God by the name of Roi, and Roi is another way of saying array to see and as well as to shepherd. So he was able, right, 
to reinterpret the true interpretation of the ancient mysteries and what we have in the Torah is that is the result of the ancient mysteries or the ancient wisdom, the Yahweh's faith out of Egypt. The Hebrews represent that 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 remnant community. So the Hebrews would be in a kind of a New Testament sense. In a New Testament sense, the faithful Jews were called out of Judaism. Right? It was called out of Judaism. So we have the Nazarenes. In the Old Testament sense, in Egypt, vis-a-vis Egypt, that the true and the faithful, right, were called out, and we have the Hebrews, right? That's why the first word that is revealed to Moses through the through the revelation of the Son as Yahweh in the burning bush, right, is tell them that the God of the Hebrews. You see, and that's kind of lost on a lot of people. The God of the Hebrews. Because when you really understand what Hebrew means, you understand that process of coming out of ignorance or coming out of spiritual darkness and crossing over into the light or crossing over into the truth. Coming out of ignorance, not knowing the truth, and now knowing the truth, therefore they were free. That's why the true and living God revealed himself to Moses and said that I am the God of the Hebrews. Tell them that the God of the Hebrews has sent you. And this is why it was very key for Moses now to ask, if I go to them and say this, they will seek to know what is your name. Because there was a confusion, right? Egypt of the time. Egypt of this particular time needs to be looked at as uh, Egypt in its own context. It's just like if we look at America today, it's much different than 40 years ago. Look how much has changed in 40 years. If we look at today's world and we go back 100 years or 150 years when the Declaration or the Emancipation Proclamation Act um, freeing the enslaved Hebrews, because they were not slaves, but they were enslaved, much has changed in society. We go back a hundred years or two hundred years. So now the period of time conservatively estimated, some would say it's 215 years. Others would say it was 430 years. Can you imagine what can happen to a people in 400 years? Can you really imagine what can happen to a people after a period of more than 400 years later? Well, we don't really have to imagine that too much. All we need to look at is the once lost but now found Beta Israel. And we will see exactly what can happen to a people, right? 400 years or so years later, even 40 years has done a whole lot to a people and how much things can change. Does that mean that the society was always like that? Well, that'd be an idiot a deduction and conclusion to make, but that it had changed. So when we're looking at the Egypt of the Exodus, this is a very unique period in history. And if we don't put the other aspects of the of the evidence and the facts together. But the first thing we have to remove out of it is is European racism. The first thing we have to remove out of it is, is the lie of white supremacy, right? And then we have to reorientate it, not to Europe, but actually reorientate it to inner Africa. And then we really get the half of the story and we begin to learn what Moses learned in the wisdom of the Egypts.
Ja, Rastafari, righteousness. Ja, liberty, Sila. Java. Ja, 